In 2016, in the midst of austerity and pressure on budgets, the Local Authority commissioned a piece of work as to how the public sector organisations, with the lead social landlord and together with the third and voluntary sector, could come together and work in genuine collaboration to maximise what resources we did have. We recognised by carrying on as we were, each individual organisation was facing an increasing deficit and by 2020-21 that collectively was over £100 million in the borough. But if we worked together in true partnership, we could close that gap to about £20 million. We also recognised that if any one organisation fell over, it would impact on all the others in St Helens, so if we didn't pull together, we would all be severely affected. It concentrated minds. But there was a real energy and will to make it happen, and thus the People's Board began its journey. This film from Dream to Reality charts some of the successes and what has been delivered by the working together, and how that has benefited the people of St Helens. You will meet some of the fantastic team that have been turning that dream into reality. Here is their story. So, so the last 12 months have seen unprecedented demand and real challenges in the NHS. What do you think our key achievements have been in the last year? Well, I agree, I agree, Geoffrey. You know, the national picture with the demand and the challenge has been our experience in St Helens. So, it's in many ways it's been a really challenging year because of the demand and also our financial challenge. So, but actually. I think despite that we've got some really impressive achievements Good. so you know in particular um, our waiting times for um, have been less than six weeks for diagnostic tests which is really impressive uh, and means that people obviously get their tests quickly so they, they need ongoing treatment that happens quickly in terms of cancer which is a you know a big priority for us our 30 our cancer 31 day target has been quite impressive and as you know NHS England measures on all these things and also our performance in terms of time um, from screening to first treatment has also been within the target set by NHS England so I think quite a lot of our key performance measures we've done really well at it. and I think given our environment I think that is really impressive for us we've also um, continued on our integration journey so you know I could go on all day there's lots of things we've put in place in the community as part of our plans to integrate services that means that we've got things to offer the public as an alternative to the acute hospital despite all of that though A&E does remain probably the the main um, headline target that like many other areas in the country we are struggling to meet um, however we've got you know we, we it's not from want of trying so the CCG staff are really involved in the A&E board um, Caroline does a really really excellent job at running our um, urgent care operational group and as a system I think we can demonstrate lots of really effective joint working which without it you know our A&E target would probably be even worse than it is but yeah. clearly it remains a top priority for the whole system for next year to try and um, get that A&E target within the national guidance and I think our other you know big achievement again over the year you know it was the first of June last year that I took up the joint post of strategic director for peoples and the accountable officer and I just think what we've done with integration has probably been our most impressive achievement over the year because we've managed to bring the system together and work in an effective way so we've integrated commissioning and because of that integration I think that's why some of the targets I'm quoting to you we've done really well and we've on, on the other side managed to work collaboratively with our providers and our main NHS providers and the council have signed that, that legal MOU which is all about a commitment to work together to improve outcomes for people in St Helens and to put that in context I don't think anywhere else around us has managed to to achieve that level of collaborative working and commitment that we've managed to achieve. So I think all of, from all of that point of view, I think it's been a really, really um, effective year and a really good year. And of course, I suppose the icing on the cake from my perspective is the fact that we've been rated good again by um, NHS England. And we were rated good last year and I know we were both really pleased, but I would say it was probably a, we just got over the line last year and it was a tentative good. Whereas I think this year we've really, to get good two years on a row, despite all our challenges, I think shows that we've really embedded much of the working that we're doing. 
So that's really, I think it's been a really, really successful year. So, despite the last 12 months of challenges, Whiston too had some good news, haven't they? Oh yeah, I mean, obviously, as you know, Whiston are, you know, Whiston or St. Helens and Hospital Trust are our main acute hospital, the majority of our population use it, and we're working with them to be our lead provider in the borough, so it was fantastic news when they got their CQC outstanding rating, you know, one of very few in the country, and I think it is testament to the quality of care. Um, so really, really good news for St Helens, given the fact that we're working so collaboratively with the Trust. And I think, I think the way that the Trust, ourselves and the Council have pulled together to set up contact cares has been another one of our yeah. biggest achievements, which we've been working towards for a couple of years, but I think last year um, the impact of contact cares did really start to take effect. Um, we, you know, we'd improvement in some of our urgent care activity, but I know when we get to Western you you're going over to contact yeah. cares to meet Carol Kilshaw, who's again been an absolute star for us in making that work. So I'm sure she'll tell you all about the work at contact cares and the impact that it's started to have over the last 12 months. We're now at Nightingale House, which is adjacent to Whiston Hospital site, and where St Helens Cares is based. And I'm joined by Carol Kilshaw, who's the manager. Hello, Carol. Can you explain what contact cares is for us? Contact Cares, previously our IASH service, transitioned to a front door model at the beginning of this year. This allowed us to offer access to services from 8 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock in the evening, 365 days a year. Contact Cares is a, a range of services that work together in an integrated way and employ over 300 staff from across five different organisations. Our front door hub is based here at Whiston Hospital on the Nightingale House site. And Within the hub we have care managers, physios, occupational therapists, nurses, housing specialists and many more staff all working together in a multidisciplinary way. They're able to hold MDT meetings so they can talk about cases together and our contact care advisors are on call 14 hours a day to offer advice, signposting and initial assessment to people over the telephone. Contact Cares working together with the wider system has helped see delayed transfers of care in St Helens remain among the lowest in the North West and also our A&E attendances in the last 12 months have seen a percentage growth from 12 down to 1%. So we've seen how Contact Cares and with Carol has been helping people in St Helens avoid hospital admissions and be discharged as soon as they're medically fit, so they aren't taking up a hospital bed. I'm joined by Andy Ashton, one of the consultants here in A&E. So Andy, what else has helped our A&E at Whiston Hospital? Well, Whiston A&E is very, very busy. Uh, we used to see 240 patients a day when we first moved in in 2010, and just recently we saw 400 patients in a day, so every year we get busier and busier. But we have done some things to make life uh, quite a lot better. So we now have the shared care record, which means that uh, when a patient comes in, we can access their GP records, which means without having to ask the patient, we can access their medications and what their uh, medical problem, pre-existing medical problems are. And obviously that can be really handy, especially if you get a patient in who can't communicate or older patients sometimes can't remember what medications they're on. So that's very helpful. Um, We've been building as well. We built on a new urgent care centre and a new waiting room, which is a bit lighter and a bit airier than the old one. And um, the urgent care centre gives us a bit more space for seeing patients. And um, another introduction we've made is that we've got um, now a 24 hour psychiatric liaison uh, service. We actually do see a lot of patients here who have mental health issues. And, um, and really they can come at any time of day or night and it's absolutely great to have somebody who is uh, in the psychiatric uh, liaison service who can see that patient promptly and uh, address their needs and direct them to wherever they need to go. So I'm joined by Lisa now and we're heading to, back to the car, we're going to head in St Helens. But I was just interested in terms of the conversation we just had with Andy, all the initiatives which are really exciting that are taking place at Worcester and A&E to improve patient flow and access to services. So Lisa, what are we doing to keep our patients safe, both in terms of quality, both in the community and in our hospitals? I think we're doing lots and lots, Geoffrey, um, and I think it's really multifaceted. Um, I think some of the work we've done around the pathway redesign has been really, really interesting. Uh -huh. 
not just to improve the pathways through you know the, the quality the safety and the effectiveness but also around the patient's experience and I think going forward that's one area I'd really like to concentrate on for the forthcoming year is about getting the patient's experience and how the changes we make actually truly impacts on them in the day-to-day -day life um, I think something else there which has been a key achievement in year is been around the work we've done around infection prevention and control and we've been supporting the community team um, to undertake um, a dip to, or not to dip um, pilot right. and this has been about trying to you know prevent unnecessary uh, urine sampling but more importantly about unnecessary antibiotics being prescribed yeah. which is a real challenge for us in St Helens. Oh, yes. um, I think what happens now is we've done lots of education both with the, with the public but also with some of our staff as well so we've trained primary care staff, we've trained some of our care home staff, our domiciliary care workers to ensure uh, that patients and residents are fully hydrated and hygiene is at the paramount because this is going to stop people needing antibiotics um, unnecessarily. I think St Helens has the highest level of um, antibiotic prescribing nationally and I suppose as you well know Geoffrey the issue with that tends to be that if people take antibiotics when they don't need it when they come to take antibiotics it's not going to work for them. But they do need them. Absolutely and I think a lot of work needs to go on with the public around when you need to take antibiotics. We've done work with our GP colleagues around um, getting some peer review in about antibiotic prescribing. We've also done some near patient testing as a pilot but I think it's the public that we need to educate more because there's a lot of pressure on, on the public given to the GPs because they feel like it's been a failed appointment if they go and they don't walk out with a prescription. This has been our most challenging year we've faced. Financially we started the financial year with a savings gap of £14.7 million which is 4.4% of our allocation. But we were successful in, in improving our performance from a 4.8 million deficit to break even at the end of the year. So Ian, how did we do that? We set a basic principle to ensure that the CCG money is spent wisely and that we get the best possible services at the best possible price. It's in the interests of everyone in our community. At the start of the year we knew that we had to improve on last year's financial position by £4.8 million. In addition we had to recognise the increasing costs of treatment and that more people would be using our services. This meant that to reach a break-even position where our expenditures would match income for the year we needed to deliver a savings target of £14.7 million. To do that we used a QUIP programme approach which is a focus on quality, innovation, productivity and prevention. We had a range of challenges and had to recover overspending budgets and reduce overspending trends. We built a detailed action plan and examined every budget and every contract to deliver mitigations in primary care, acute care, IT developments, continuing health care, mental health and other areas. This involved some difficult decisions and required us to positively manage our relationships with partners. Our financial position did deteriorate during the year, predominantly related to increased demand for emergency and urgent care. We were able to recover due to the positive benefits of our integrated care schemes and some non-recurrent sources. These schemes help reduce non-elective demand by working collaboratively some of these schemes will be further developed this coming year to expand on these successes and we have developed a detailed plan on savings. The non-recurrent nature of recovery action has resulted in audit qualification in the use of our resources around economy, efficiency and effectiveness. This reflects the ongoing requirement to further strengthen financial sustainability. NHS England has however removed us from direction by the Secretary of State for Health which is confirmation that our governance and financial standing is on track, despite next year being equally as challenging from a financial perspective. By the end of the year, we had received £339.1 million in allocations and had spent the same amount and therefore delivered a financial break even for the year, which is really positive. We're now at the St Helens Urgent Treatment Centre, which was upgraded last December from the walk-in centre 
following a national directive to make it clear for the public what urgent healthcare services are available. So Lynn, you're the nurse manager here. What difference has this made? We're the first standalone urgent treatment centre in the North West. We're open 365 days of the year, so from 7am till 9.45 Monday to Saturday, and then on Sunday from 9am till 9.45. Uh, we have a GP on site now, which is a difference to how it's been in the past. The GP is on site Monday to Friday between 11am and 8pm. That GP provides extra support for the highly skilled um, and knowledgeable nurses and healthcare assistants within the department. Um, we, are, we can see patients with a wide variety of illness and injury. We have got on-site x-ray facilities and also an on-site pharmacy. So for the vast majority of patients, um, they can be seen, assessed and treated within a couple of hours. We're here at Atlas House and I'm with Anne Dunn. Children and young people are vital to the future of St Helens and working collaboratively to keep them safe and well is one of our key priorities. I'm one of the senior assistant directors for Safeguarding. It's one of the first integrated posts in the borough, so I work across both the CCG and the local authority. My role in this is to keep um, the partnership on track with all the statutory guidance. So we've had two key successful um, tasks this year, one being the harmful sexual behaviours framework and also that of um, developing, uh, being instrumental in the development of the safeguarding arrangements as per the new statutory guidance. So for harmful sexual behaviours, we've been um, successful in being one of the early adopter sites um, and this enables us to have a full implementation plan work with the NSPCC on a national level and um, we, we run a local group, implementation group, chaired by our designated nurse for safeguarding children. Um, in relation to the multi-agency arrangements for safeguarding, again key players in that, instrumental in the development of it all and they've now been formally ratified um, by our governing body and it allows us to be placed on an equal footing across the local authority, police and health footprint to ensure that we keep children safe. So Rachel. Yes Geoffrey. Um, just bring us up to speed in terms of where we are in our social care and particularly the intermediate um, tenancies and the transitional beds. Okay, well we've been doing a lot of work over the last 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. To ensure that we've got enough places where people who may be uh, medically fit from hospital but actually not quite ready to go home and that could be because they're still quite frail or they feel a bit inconfident about actually returning home or it could be because actually they need ad aids and adaptations fitted before they can return home. So we've been busy developing some more beds to be able to support people in, in that kind of situation. Right. So Brookfield in particular we now have 30 beds which is testament to the staff that work there across health and social care to, to kind of all hands to the pump and have, have developed those beds and are working really well together so that they can support many different needs at Brookfield. And they also work with people who actually were at risk of going into hospital but with a bit of support for, for a short period can get back on their feet and actually return home. So essentially Brookfield is really about actually making sure that people can stay at home for as long as possible and return home as quickly as, as possible with a little bit of support. We've also developed um, 17 transitional flats which complement Brookfield in so much as it may be that um, an individual is more independent and actually could return into a flat environment but still needs some health and social care to support them. So within those 17 flats we've got, we've, we've got the opportunity to support couples, we've also got the opportunity again to support people who are at risk of going into hospital and for a short period can stay in a tenancy, get some, may even get some help with um, housing support so that they can think about their next move, so go there for a temporary period where they're, where they're in between properties. So altogether, um, adding that up, that's 47 um, beds that can be utilised by residents in St Helens who, as I say, are at risk of going into hospital or need to come out of hospital because they've actually are medically, as the hospital say, medically fit for discharge. So now back to the transitional flats. There are 15 transitional flats at Parmount Court and we're working with Taurus who provide those flats to think about um, where Parmount Court shuts where we can locate those flats and actually we're planning in the next stage of this to develop even more flats so that we've got um, and ultimately we think as, as, as many flats as we can actually um, develop with Taurus we could actually utilise 
and we can even start to begin to think about people who maybe don't fit the criteria of hospital discharge or avoiding hospital but maybe struggling with their mental health or maybe um, at risk of being homeless that once again could be supported for a transitional period to get back on, on their feet and, and maybe think about further accommodation in the future. So we've now arrived at Haydock Medical Centre and I'm going to be meeting with Dr Martin Breach and Dr Laura Pogue. Primary care networks are seen in the NHS long-term plan as the building blocks of every integrated health and care system, with general practice taking a leading role. Networks, rather than the individual practices, will be expected to provide a wider range of primary care services to patients, including a wider set of staff roles, for example extended access and social prescribing, two areas we've begun to deliver. Martin, you're a GP at Haydock Medical Centre and the director of the PCM, the Primary Care Network, in Newton and Haydock Clinical Network. Social prescribing is something we hear a lot about, but what is it and what are you doing in practice? Social prescribing deals with uh, social needs of patients, so where perhaps problems of isolation, uh, of social disadvantage are the primary issues. Practices can refer to prescribers who can work with them and engage them in social activities. That might be community groups, it might be activities, it might be access to services or access to funding. So this is uh, an approach which has been used uh, nationally uh, in pilot areas with tremendous results. So we're really hoping to harness this energy and enthusiasm and make it work for patients here. Delighted to be joined by Dr Laura Pogue who's been doing a lot of work in community mental health services. So Laura, how do you see that working and what are the challenges and what have been the successes? So we have a number of fantastic achievements this year. Uh, I'm very proud of a pilot scheme that we ran actually with North West Boroughs, our secondary care mental health services, and linking in a consultant psychiatrist and some of his team um, working with a number of GP practices, trying to upskill them, develop their confidence, and in turn see if it had any effect on reducing number of referrals and improving, I suppose, quality of care and timely access to care or early access to treatment in a primary care setting and that has worked fantastically well and we're really really proud of that pilot project. Another area that we're very much developing in St Helens is our suicide prevention strategy group. We've needed to do this. It's really important for us in St Helens because unfortunately, as you're probably aware, we have the highest levels uh, of suicide in the UK. So that, that group is really well established now and we are looking with all our partner, partner organisations in St Helens to develop um, really consensus and looking at a really robust strategy and a suite of training products um, that will really support a variety of services, uh, community-based patients, um, carers, perhaps those bereaved by suicide and that there's you know, a really strong push to develop that in the next 12 months. Uh, so I think that's, that's a huge achievement for St Helens. So I'm joined by Dr Michael Genese, who is the Deputy Clinical Chair of the CCG and serves on the governing body along with me. We're talking about primary care networks, Mike, so tell us a bit about how they've been developing and, and what's your, been your role as that as the lead clinician for the CCG. In St Helens, our 34 practices have grouped themselves into four networks, Central, South, North and Newton and Haydock. The networks locally are still in a very early stage of development, uh, but when they're fully established, uh, probably over the next three to five years, uh, they will provide patients with a wider set of staff roles, such as clinical pharmacists, social prescribers who will advise patients on lifestyle, physiotherapists, mental health uh, practitioners and paramedics. The focus will be on providing personalised care to patients that will surely improve health outcomes. These networks are small enough to provide the personal care valued by both patients and GPs, but large enough to have impact and economies of scale through a better collaboration between practices and others in the local health and social care system. I'm here now at the Beacon Building in the centre of St Helens and partnership working has been a big part of the integration of health and social care and the key to making this happen 
has been the involvement of our third sector and voluntary sector organisations here in St Helens as partners in St Helens CAS. Sally Yeoman is the Chief Executive of Holton and St Helens VCA. So Sally, how is partnership working from your point of view? We've always been keen to work closely with health and social care and our joint work on developing a strategy and action plan is a really important step forward for the voluntary sector. Relationships have improved over the years and there's definitely been a culture shift and I can see that people are thinking differently about how to deliver services in future and work collaboratively for the good of everyone in the borough. We also work in partnership with Health Watch St Helens and I'm joined now by Jane Parkinson Loftus. So Jane, tell us your perspective on how things are working. Health Watch St Helens has been working really closely with the CCG. We've worked on a number of projects together in the past year. We're here to represent the views of local people around the health and social care services that they use. We hold listening events where we gather feedback and views and we share these with commissioners and providers to help drive improvement. I'm joined now by Mark Waits, who's our lay member for public and patient involvement. Our CCG is committed to carrying out meaningful engagement and communicating effectively with the local community to give people a chance to be involved in and influence their health care. We also have a statutory duty under the Health and Social Care Act to ensure the public have their thoughts and experiences taken into account when we commission or redesign services. So Mark, how do you see that working? My role really is to oversee the engagement work with the public is enabling their voice to be heard in terms of the services that they receive from both health and social care. Um, and we've worked very hard on engagement this year. Uh, the NHS has given us a green rating for that, which is an improvement on last year, and is also a tribute to the work of the communications and engagement team. We've worked very hard to achieve that. We're here now in the oppressive surroundings of the Council Chamber of St Helens Town Hall, and I'm joined by Sue Forster, who's the Director of Public Health in St Helens. The People's Board has been a key part of our work, Sue, so how have you seen that working from your perspective in St Helens Cares and what difference has that made? The People's Board, it's, um, it's the bringing together of the Community Safety Partnership and the Health and Wellbeing Board, which are statutory functions for Health and the Council. And basically, we realised back in 2016 that some of the issues that we had in St Helens, they affected health, they affected social care, they affected public health, they affected the police, fire, housing, and actually what we could do better together was to come together on those issues and make better use of our uh, resources. So really about um, our mission statement was improving people's lives in St Helens together by tackling the challenge of cost and demand and that's really where we started. So we're in the Mayor's Parlour in the Town Hall following the People's Board today and I'm joined by Mike Perlin, the Chief Executive of the Local Authority, Councillor Marlene Quinn, the Cabinet Member for Health and Social Care, and Professor Sarah O'Brien, the Accountable Officer and the People's Director in the Borough Council. So our People's Board encompasses not just the Health and Wellbeing Board, but our Community Safety Partnership. So what kind of things were you discussing this afternoon that might align to both health and with community safety? And I think that's a really good point, Jeff. I've got the agenda here, but I think, I think we've recognised as well, I think this is another demonstration of how we've matured, that we've probably the first couple of years with the People's Board, we did an awful lot to focus on health and care integration, mm -hmm. rightly, but this last few months we've just been reaffirming really and re-looking really at what our priorities should be and as part of that work there's been an acknowledgement that we now also need to make sure the community safety partnership agenda is to the fore so this afternoon we were going through crime statistics but we've also agreed our priorities for the next year and domestic abuse has been agreed as a real priority for the borough and that that straddles both people's agenda but also community safety agenda so i think that's really important and it's a place-based approach so um these, these agendas link in with one another in a very, very place-specific way. Mm. I think one of the things we'll be working on through the People's Board in the years ahead is the localities model and maybe reduce the cost on one of our partners in the system yeah. and improve the people's lives, which comes us back to the vision yeah. of the People's Board. Yeah. Earlier in the week we were filming at um, both at Brookfield and also at uh, St Helens Cares of our hospital 
undermining how you see it, linking with the People's Board, but also with St Helens Cares and that team working in an integrated way. I think this has been a massive achievement. Uh, when I look at Nightingale House and the um, NHS staff working alongside local government staff, but all wearing one identity, St Helens Curse um, or Care Model. Um, and it has been a massive achievement that. Looking at Brookfield, um, it's been completely revamped, modernised, and it's delivering um, that extra support needed when someone's not sick enough to be remain in hospital but needs some form of rehabilitation. And I think without the People's Board, both Nightingale House and Brookfield and the relationship at Paramount Court with our uh, supported tenancies there, I don't think any of them would have come about. Um, so it's been a massive achievement for the service users, for the residents that actually need that, that support health-wise. I hope you agree with me that this film has shown some amazing people from across the borough, from different organisations, both public and third sector, pulling together to make that difference every day to the people of St Helens. This is our dream and our reality, and our journey to go further and deeper will continue. You too can get involved. Check our website for more in-depth interviews with some of the people on this film and how you too can make a difference in your local area. My name is Kath Miller and I just wanted to say a little bit about what has happened to me. When I fell, I was going to the garage, to the garage at the back, and then I went flat down, right on the floor. I thought, this, this is not happening. I had got the cur alarm, but I'd left it in the shower. I had a struggle getting up off the floor after dialing 999. The paramedics got me in the ambulance and took me to Whiston. I was in Whiston on the Thursday. On the Friday evening, I was in Brookfield the following day. I'm Alison, I'm an occupational therapist within the reablement team. So Kath was admitted to Brookfield Intermediate Care Centre and she was in hospital for about 48 hours. Within that time the, th the therapists on the ward assessed her as requiring further rehab but obviously hospital wasn't the right place for that. It was important for her to be at Brookfield's to improve her confidence um, and mobility but she, obviously she came to a point where she no longer required to be here but we agreed to continue a therapy in the community um, to try and get it as independent as possible. When I first um, walked upstairs on my own it was another step that I didn't think would be possible but when I could do that myself I thought wow a miracle and I could shower and I could use the toilet. I thought it was wonderful. So for Kath, everyone coming together and working jointly as a team has improved her experience of NHS and social services. And we've all worked together to achieve her personalised goals and what she wants to do. My main thing was getting back to the art class. When I'm painting and drawing, it is because I am drawing what I can see, put on a piece of paper and bring it to life. I don't think any one of us can go through life without setbacks. 
It's not just the problem, it's how do I deal with this problem? The people that have done this for me, that have put me back to where I am now, again, have faith in them because they are wonderful people.